Hello and welcome to the University of Nottingham. I'm joined today by Professor William Kay, who is Professor of Theology at Glyndwr University and is uh, a world-renowned expert on Pentecostalism. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us here today, William. Uh, we're going to start by talking about um, the history of Pentecostalism. Now, I am a uh, historian of modern Christianity, uh, and I've been studying modern Christianity for quite a long time, but I'm very struck by the fact that Pentecostal history doesn't impinge on the um, historical mainstream as much as perhaps it should do. I wondered if that's your feeling as well, and if you've got any uh, views about why that might be. Yes, well, I think probably the very early Pentecostal, certainly in Britain, uh, if I talk just about Britain for a minute, um, were really kept themselves to themselves. In fact, they felt they'd been thrown out of the traditional mainline churches. Um, they came very often from non-conformist backgrounds. And uh, once they started to do strange things like speak in tongues, they were seen as um, persona non grata. They were, they were really uh, excluded, at least they felt themselves to be excluded. Perhaps they weren't, but they, they felt themselves to be excluded. And um, I mean, in Europe, you had uh, occasions where once uh, people who were uh, Lutherans began to uh, avoid infant baptism and insist on adult baptism by immersion, they found themselves not welcomed in the Lutheran church. So T.B. Barrett in Norway found himself really against his wishes, being pushed out of the Lutheran church. Actually, he was a Methodist, but, but many of the people who joined the first Pentecostal churches were Lutheran. But in, in, in Britain, I guess the position was uh, to do with being feeling themselves pushed out. And there's, a, there's another thing too, um, the earliest Pentecostals in Britain were by and large pacifist. Um, now, the beginnings of Pentecostalism in, in, in Britain occurred with what was called the Sunderland Convention. And this was uh, arranged by an Anglican vicar, a man called Alexander Boddy, in 1908, and he, uh, he set up these conventions, drew people into the conventions, and uh, he, uh, when the war broke out in 1914, he was not a pacifist. But uh, many of the early Pentecostals were pacifists. Some went to prison for their pacifism. And as a consequence, there was a divergence. So maybe it's partly a matter of their beliefs that they spoke in tongues and they believed in healing and prophecy, but also because of their pacifist tendencies. Mm. That's interesting, because even I mean, there's an enormous amount written about the history of evangelicalism, but you, I sense often that in the standard histories of evangelicalism, Pentecostalism is literally seen as sort of noises off, isn't it, really? So it's not, it's, it's, it's uh, overlooked. So high time that it's um, you know, integrated into the broader stream of religious history, it seems to me. Yes, I, I agree. I, I completely agree. I mean, the Pentecostals um, got going in in America. The biggest group, Assemblies of God, was founded in 1914. Mm -hmm. uh, in Britain, the Elim group was founded in 1915, and the Assemblies of God in Britain in 1924. So we're talking about the really the beginning of the 20th century. Um, of course, America's scene is you know richer, more vibrant, more varied than Britain's. But in Britain, the Pentecostals were a kind of on the edge of nonconformity, I suppose. But they did sort of stride out into society. I mean, they very quickly held big meetings. It's perhaps forgotten today that someone like George Jeffreys hired the Royal Albert Hall yeah. and, and, and filled the Royal Albert Hall. And, and uh, on not just one occasion, but he had a Whitson convention for about s six or seven years in a row. Uh, baptized a thousand people by immersion on a, on a, you know, in, a, in an afternoon in the Royal Albert Hall. So they did hit the national press. There are reports in the Ma Daily Mail and the Daily Express of, of this sort of thing happening. So they did try to reach out into society um, with healing campaigns in the, in the post-war Britain. Um, and in America, uh, well with its diversity, uh, they did the same. I mean, they held their tent meetings and their uh, crusades and their other activities uh, in, the, in the United States. 
Um, it's rather different in Europe and in other parts of the world. Mm. Something you wrote um, a few years ago, you said something which I found very interesting, and that's that the world of the 1880s and 1890s that gave us um, Walter Pater and Oscar Wilde also was the world that gave us Pentecostalism, which is, you know, that the juxtaposition of Pater and Wilde, who are the, the sort of the, the decadent end of aestheticism and the Pentecostal world appear to be very different. I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about how you think that works. Well, I, I think there was a kind of a millennial expectation, perhaps a little bit like the 1990s. So I think the 1890s was a, a period of time when there were eschatological um, heightened expectations. And certainly in the United States and to some extent in Britain, and I think it's from these heightened expectations, you know, is this going to be a, a critical moment in, in history? Uh, has God's calendar finally ticked over to a new era? So those kinds of questions were, were I think, in people's minds. And there were, there were kind of prayer meetings on the last day of, of you know, um, 1899 as you switch over into 1900 and people were really not all but there were some people who had those expectations so and I think they saw uh, the aesthetes in, in so far as they noticed them mm -hmm. as kind of people who were showing how the world was going wrong mm -hmm. and that they had to have a new beginning for the for the new century right as a small point but as a matter of interest did they see the 20th century beginning in 1900 or 1901 <laughs> I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm not sure. I think they probably saw it at the beginning of 19, 1900, I think. Right. So it was actually the date change that was exciting them. Yes, I, I, I think so. Um, I mean, uh, but that's the other thing to say, because when the outpouring of the Spirit occurred, I really, to, to give you the kind of story as I see it, yeah. the, the first thing that happens in the UK is the Welsh Revival. Yeah. Welsh Revival happens, starts in the autumn of 1904, and swings across right through until the autumn of 1905. So you have the Welsh Revival. This is an astonishing event. It grips Wales, as you know, and uh, these are Welsh preachers. Welsh people are influenced. Uh, crime statistics go down. Industrial relations change. Uh, all kinds of things happen in the Welsh valleys through the Welsh Revival. And some of the people who are converted in the Welsh Revival later go on to become Pentecostal leaders. And I'm thinking here of George Jeffries, actually, and his brother Stephen. So they, they come from the Welsh Revival. So that's 1904 and 1905. And then there's a link from the Welsh Revival to the Azusa Street Revival in, in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, because there's actually a letter written to Evan Roberts by people. And so the, 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 and someone who has been present in the Welsh Revival actually goes over, a Baptist uh, called Joseph Small, S-M-A, a -L -E. He goes over and preaches. And so that revival has a link with the Welsh revival. So in some senses, Pentecostalism comes out of the revivalism at the beginning of the century. Mm. Yes. And of course, it's still quite a, a new movement, isn't it? So there's that sense of, um, I mean, one of the things which strikes me actually with the writing of 20th century history is uh, we've only really started to take it seriously since we got into the 21st century. So when I began my career, you know, there was one guy who worked on religion in the First World War, and that's about it. Uh, but now it seems that everyone is um, finding that studying the 20th century is what they want to do. So, Well, I think it is interesting. I mean, for, for the Pentecostals, uh, the Welsh Revival occurs and the other revivals. And you could see Pentecostalism as a kind of attempt to bottle the revival mm. and, to, and to re recreate it or make it continuing. And so the, 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 the Pentecostal churches uh, are, are a kind of an attempt to uh, carry the revival forward. And, that, and the denominations are then formed post-revival. And they kind of organize it and set up a, a kind of ecclesiology and a form of worship that, that people who'd been in the revival would be at home with. Yes, so clearly the revivals were absolutely critical to launching. Yes, I, I would say so. And, and I mentioned two, but there were others. There was one in Mukti in India, mm. and there was one in, in uh, Poinyang in, in uh, Korea. Uh, so there are a number of revivals. There's one in Chile. So the, the revivals that occur at the beginning of the 20th century are to some extent the sort of seedbed for later Pentecostal churches. Well, thank you very much, William. That, I think, gives us a very helpful um, introduction to the 
um, history of Pentecostalism.